Thank you very much, Uma. And I just want to take one moment to uh, congratulate my Mount Sinai colleagues, Jean-Fred, uh, Judy Cho, and David Sacker. It's uh, truly an honor and privilege to work with them every day. And congratulations to them. So for the next 20 minutes or so, um, I'm charged with talking about uh, the positioning of biologics and ulcerative colitis and whether that may change. And here we go. Disclosures are also in the book. So we'll talk about uh, the older biologics as well as the newer ones. So this would include infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, the anti-TNF antibodies that are approved for ulcerative colitis. And we'll also talk about uh, the newest kit on the block, vedalizumab, which is an anti-alpha-4 beta-7 integrin antibody, also approved for the treatment of UC earlier this year. And uh, we'll discuss factors for positioning of these agents in UC. And um, I have to give credit to Steve Hanauer, who I think created this slide, and may show you a similar slide for his talk on Crohn's disease. But uh, suffice it to say that although there's a lot of discussion about top-down therapy in Crohn's disease, we have not had very much of that discussion in ulcerative colitis. So for the moment, uh, we generally kind of look at a patient and determine whether they have mild, moderate, or severe symptoms of their disease, or endoscopically if the disease is severe. We're looking at the presentation, and depending on that presentation, we'll choose treatment accordingly. So for the patients who are on the milder to moderate end of the spectrum, generally the platform therapy here is aminosalicylates. And if you really look at the literature critically, probably about 40, 45 percent of patients may do well for a long period of time on aminosalicylates, so that becomes their maintenance therapy. But for patients who are a bit sicker, then we move up to corticosteroids. And uh, the patient who requires corticosteroids, we know, has a worse prognosis. They're more likely to have a colectomy even within one year of their first use of corticosteroids. Also, we know about the long-term side effects of steroids and the lack of long-term benefit from steroids, so we need an exit strategy. Uh, for some patients, this might be aminosalicylates, but I have to say the evidence for that is not very robust. Uh, for other patients, uh, this will be a thiopurine. There again, the evidence is not so robust, uh, but it is used and probably effective for some patients. And then for sicker patients and patients who fail these earlier tiers of therapy, we move on, and historically we've gone to infliximab for non-hospitalized patients, but we'll talk about the use of this agent for hospitalized severe UC as well. Historically, cyclosporine has been used at very selected centers for the most part. I think that's falling out of favor, and I'll show you some of the data why that may be. And then longer-term maintenance therapy after that will include infliximab or uh, maintenance anti-TNF and a thiopurine, probably in combination, and failing all of that, the patient ends up with a colectomy. So the question is, we have three new biologic agents introduced in the last two years. Adalimumab was approved for UC in uh, late 2012, golimumab in 2013, and in May, June, we had the addition of vetalizumab. So do these fit in any differently into this paradigm of therapy? Well, what are the considerations for positioning a therapy in ulcerative colitis? Uh, my colleagues, Asher Kornbluth and David Sacker, uh, wrote the guidelines uh, last published and updated in 2010 for UC, for the ACG. And the considerations that they highlight are severity of disease, which we've already discussed, extent of disease, which is most appropriate to consider when we're talking about topical therapies delivered via the rectum, uh, but probably less relevant for biologic therapies. And uh, what, what therapies uh, have, have, has the patient failed, and what are they on concurrently? Safety is an issue in selection, certainly for patients, uh, it's at the top of their mind. And cost is going to be very paramount for where we position biologics. We cannot, given the cost of biologics, use them for every patient who walks through the door. So the key factors are really going to be disease severity, prior and current therapies, safety. Those are the big things. Now, we'll talk about uh, a few of these studies here. All studies come with great acronyms, and you need a lexicon of these acronyms to understand the literature. For infliximab, we'll talk about ACT-1 and ACT-2. We'll talk about an investigator-initiated study uh, comparing infliximab to cyclosporin called CISIF, coming from the French group, JETED. Um, adalimumab, we'll talk about ULTRA-2, but there's also an ULTRA-1. For golimumab, uh, there's the pursuit study, and for vetalizumab, we're talking about Gemini 1. 
it'd be fun to make up more names for these studies in the future. This is Act 1 and Act 2, um, old data at this point. And uh, the take home message here is in the short term, you see clinical response rates in about two thirds of patients. This is by the Mayo score. And clinical remission rates in about one third of patients. And for this non hospitalized patient population, it didn't really seem to make a difference whether the patients were getting five or 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. They seemed to do about as well. And so for the outpatient world, uh, really, we're using five milligrams per kilogram, and the regimen is week zero, two, and six, and then every eight weeks thereafter. Now, what about the situation in severe ulcerative colitis? These are patients who are steroid refractory. They're hospitalized. They have hot, severe ulcerative colitis. There are a number of studies that you see listed here, the most important one being uh, the Yanaro study at the bottom. Uh, which was the larger prospective study. And here, it's an, important to note, patients got one single infusion of five milligrams per kilogram. Um, most of them were uh, on the severe range, but there was a spectrum of moderate to severe UC, even though they were hospitalized. And you can see here that two-thirds of the patients who got one dose of infliximab avoided colectomy at 90 days, whereas only one-third of the placebo-treated patients avoided colectomy. So this clearly was an important signal that infliximab and anti-TNFs in general could be useful in this uh, fairly refractory population. So how does this stack up against cyclosporin, which uh, before was the, the, the king of the hill for severe UC? It really was the, the ultimate before colectomy for many patients at academic medical centers. And in this study out of France, there was a comparison between induction dosing with infliximab as compared to cyclosporin. And it's very obvious to you looking at these curves that they're very much overlapping. There's no obvious difference in the outcomes of these patients. We're looking here at the, uh, the Lichtiker score over time. And so I think in clinical practice, it's so difficult, complex uh, uh, therapy to give cyclosporine measure levels, transfer the patient over to thiopurines all the while, tapering steroids, giving Bactrim for the risk of uh, pneumocystis, uh, you know, basically, I think, by and large, cyclosporine has been abandoned in the use of severe UC for most patients. So now we move to the newer anti-TNFs, and the first one will be adalimumab, of course. It's been very familiar through our treatment of uh, Crohn's disease for many years, and the, the dosing here is, uh, at least in, in this study, and uh, the approved dosing is exactly the same as was done for Crohn's disease, induction dosing being 160 milligrams sub-Q, two weeks later, 80 milligrams sub-Q, and after that, you embark on 40 milligrams every other week. So a few things to point out about the patient populations in the, in the studies that I'll show you. Um, the majority, uh, about half of the patients had pan-ulcerative colitis. Um, these were fairly sick patients. Uh, almost half of the patients had an elevated CRP above uh, roughly five. The Mayo score was between eight and nine, so fairly sick. Uh, more than half of the patients had concomitant use of corticosteroids. About a third had or more had uh, immune modulator on board. And looking at the bottom here, prior anti-TNF use uh, was for about 40% of patients. In all studies that I'm going to show you, and in all studies that I'm aware of, every time you have prior treatment with an anti-TNF and you failed it or you've had uh, stopped that prior anti-TNF, the next treatment tends to be less effective. So you should have to take that into account as you're looking at the results. But these results are pretty good. If you look at uh, the ULTRA-2 study, the week eight and week 52 results, you see that remission was achieved significantly in 16.5% compared to 9% placebo. The response rates were about half of patients compared to 35% on placebo. And mucosal healing rates about 40% compared to 31.7% on placebo at week eight. The rates drop as you go further along the line at one year. Uh, but still you see that the drug is more effective than placebo across the board. And if you want to make sure that the patient uh, was uh, responding or remitting at both week eight and week 52, you can look at the extreme right-hand side and you see what you get over the course of a year. And you can look at this as a more sustained clinical remission or response or mucosal healing. 
Now, what about prior infliximab exposure, which was permitted and, as I said, occurred in about 40% of these patients? Well, uh, as is often true, patients who were TNF naive did better overall than the patients who were TNF uh, antagonist experienced. And you can see that the, the overall uh, rate of remission at week 52 in the TNF experience was roughly half of what was seen in the TNF naive patients. Um, so, and if we're looking at response, it, it's more or less the same message. So basically, you're going to expect to see lower response and remission rates if the patient has had a prior anti-TNF. What about steroid sparing? Here the data look pretty good. Uh, more patients who were assigned to adalimumab were able to taper off of steroids and do well. And what about subgroup analyses? Did it matter what weight the patient was, given that this is flat, not weight-based dosing, as we do with infliximab? What about prior anti-TNF use? Things stack, stack up still in favor of the drug, um, even though I showed you that the response and remission rates are overall lower. It's still favorable for drug. Baseline CRP, baseline Mayo score, disease extent, disease duration, endoscopy score, all these odd ratios line up in favor of treatment, so there's consistency of effect across these subgroups. Well, we'll turn now to golimumab, another sub-Q agent, and uh, this one had uh, basically no prior TN uh, TNF antagonist uh, treated patients in this study, so a little bit different. And you see on the left-hand side the placebo response remission and mucosal healing rates. You can see that the placebo remission rates were quite low at week six, and with the drug, um, you can see two different dose regimens. One was induction with 200 and then 100. The other was 400, then 200 sub-Q. And you can see that there isn't very much difference in these dosing groups. They look fairly equivalent, but it's certainly significantly better than the placebo rates. And if we go to the longer-term uh, remission and response rates, uh, really looking at maintenance of remission, uh, you see again that the drug does better than placebo. And if we're looking at corticosteroid free remission at week 54, here unfortunately the drug did not meet its, uh, this outcome, but it may not have been adequately powered to do this. Um, these are always messy things in clinical trials. The tapering regimens are not necessarily adhered to. So this wasn't a primary objective of, of the study. My own anticipation is this will not behave in the clinic any differently than any other anti-TNF. But now we have to talk about the safety profile. We said that's another factor in the selection and positioning of these agents. And we know from the treat registry um, that the biggest risk for mortality is not the anti-TNF, in this case infliximab, it's not the thiopurine or immune modulator, it's really the addition of steroids. Um, so these are multivariate analyses, independent risk factors, but if we're looking at serious infections, steroids have a signal, but also infliximab has a signal uh, independently. So as we know, there is an increased risk of all sorts of infections, including serious infections with anti-TNFs. And just to recapitulate the anticipated uh, side effect profile of anti-TNFs, and we can say that virtually all of these are a class effect, there's infection and malignancy with black box warnings for these, black box, box, uh, black box warning for hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma with adalimumab and infliximab, reactivation of hepatitis B and tuberculosis, so you know that patients need to be screened for these things before going on to therapy. Um, skin cancer, uh, actually a, a small increased risk of melanoma. Um, psoriasis and other immune-mediated skin lesions. In fact, all sorts of auto, autoimmune conditions may arise in the setting of TNF antagonism, including lupus-like syndromes in a small minority of patients. There's the possibility of developing antibodies against the drug, so immunogenicity, and that will be true for all biologics, and then demyelinating disorders, exacerbation of CHF, and very rare liver toxicity. So obviously in the clinic, you go through this lengthy discussion with, with your patients to make sure they understand these things. You make sure that you appropriately pre-screen and monitor your patients on therapy, and that's as it should be. Um, then we come to a new class of agents, and here the target is not TNF, but it's actually blocking the leukocyte from making its way into the mucosa. 
because these are the inflammatory cells that drive the disease. And we've learned a lot about the processes of uh, leukocyte trafficking and how to intervene, what the targets are to intervene here. And there's a very coordinated series of molecular events that uh, start with tethering of the leukocyte as it rolls along in the, in the capillaries, and then uh, integrin activation, then the cell adheres to the endothelium and then makes its way through into the muco mucosa through diapedesis. And the key molecules here are the alpha-4 integrins, and very specifically for the gut would be alpha-4 beta-7 integrin and its interaction with MADCAM, which is mucosal adrenaline cellular adhesion molecule one. Now, you know about natalizumab and its problems with PML uh, as a treatment for Crohn's disease, but here vetalizumab is really a much more selective uh, uh, anti-trafficking agent. As I said, uh, vetalizumab binds alpha-4 beta-7 very specifically, not alpha-4 uh, bearing cells broadly, and it interferes with that interaction with MADCAM, and so it's going to intervene in gut inflammation. Whereas in uh, CNS surveillance, which is important for the risk of PML and the risk with natalizumab, um, alpha-4 beta-1 and its adherence to VCAM seems to be quite prominent, and vetalizumab doesn't adhere to alpha-4 beta-1, only alpha-4 beta-7. And so therefore, there should be no interference with CNS immune surveillance. What were the characteristics of the patients in Gemini 1? You can see that um, about a third of patients had pan uc uh, but if we want to think about extensive colitis, it was about 45% of patients beyond the splenic flexure. Um, Mayo score is similar to what you've seen from the other studies, about 8.6, about 35% uh, on steroids, about um, another quarter of patients were on immune modulator. Note that in the U.S., the FDA mandated cessation of thiopurines as patients came into the study. However, that was permitted in Europe, so they could continue it. And then prior anti-TNF use in uh, approaching for 50% uh, of patients overall. So that's a key variable here. What does the efficacy look like at week six? Well, clinical response, highly statistically significant, and you see a treatment effect over placebo about 22% for clinical remission, very significant, a uh, treatment effect of approaching 12%, 11.5%, and mucosal healing, a treatment effect of 16%. So that's week six, a relatively early timing for the outcome. What about the longer-term outcomes? Well, patients who responded to this initial induction therapy were then re-randomized and could either get every eight-week vetalizumab or every four-week vetalizumab or placebo. And whether we're talking about clinical response, durable clinical response, meaning each and every time point, mucosal healing, durable clinical remission, or corticosteroid-free remission, all of these outcomes were, were really uh, very robust in the analysis. What about time to onset of effect? Um, this may not be quite as rapid as the effect of blocking TNF, but nevertheless, after week two, you see separation from placebo in the partial Mayo score. And it does seem to continue to improve all the way down to week six, which makes you think perhaps that you'll continue to see improvement beyond week six. And you do see that here, a little bit more improvement in the partial Mayo score as patients continue along in the protocol, although maybe not too much more, whereas the placebo patients are becoming more and more active as the drug, uh, drug effect leaches out. What about steroid sparing effect? Well, here again, you see a robust difference with treatment, maintenance treatment. Notice that you don't see a separation of the curve till after 30 weeks, and that's because this drug has a longish half-life of three weeks. So by the time five half-lives have elapsed and the drug has, uh, is gone, uh, you don't see this uh, separation of curves until after that's happened. What about prior anti-TNF use? Same message as with the uh, other secondary anti-TNFs. You see a better response rate in patients who had no prior anti-TNF exposure than the ones who did have prior anti-TNF exposure, but still the effects are very robust. And subgroup analyses, uh, this is a hint for your test. Your post-test is coming up. Um, it didn't matter whether, regardless of age, disease duration, prior TNF use, corticosteroids, immune modulators, baseline fecal calprotectin, baseline Mayo score, disease extent, basically the odds ratios lined up in favor of the drug. 
What about safety? Um, maybe the most important thing to tell you is despite a very vigorous program to detect PML in this very large development program in both UC and Crohn's, there have been no cases of PML. And if this drug behaved like natalizumab, we would have expected to have seen seven or eight such cases by now, and we have not. There are rare infusion-related reactions. Uh, immunogenicity, this is a biologic. Uh, these do occur. Um, mostly they're, they're uh, very, uh, mostly we could not detect any loss of response related to immunogenicity, but there is that possibility. And tuberculosis does not seem to be much of a problem with this agent either. In fact, the only infection that truly pops out of the safety data set is an increased instance of nasopharyngitis. Uh, not serious, increased risk of serious infections, no increased risks of cancers. Now, just to mention, you should know the dosing for these agents. Infliximab, I assume you know, adalimumab, you know. The newer ones, golimumab, would be dosed as 200 milligrams sub-Q at week zero, 100 milligrams sub-Q at week two, and then at week six, and then every four weeks thereafter. And vedalizumab is simply 300 milligrams at week zero to six, and then every eight weeks, very similar to infliximab. So to wrap it up, uh, where do we position these biologics? And I'm more or less lumping together the anti-TNF antibodies, uh, which have one mechanism, and vedalizumab, a different mechanism. Um, early or late disease does not seem to be an issue. There's treatment effect there uh, in the induction phase. And in the maintenance phase, we showed you data for maintenance effects for all of these medications. Um, we showed you that the drug can be efficacious in sparing of steroids. So one consideration is where to position these drugs after steroids. If a patient is on steroids or failing it, is that time to start anti-TNF or VETO? Either would be a choice. So you can leave that up to the patient or you can express your opinion. After failure of immune modulators, that was a fair number of patients here. Primary anti-TNF failure is one question. Um, when someone fails their first anti-TNF, the question is whether it's been adequately dosed, and that's particularly the case in severe UC, where we, we really are starting to understand that you need higher doses of anti-TNFs to get the disease under control. For secondary uh, TNF failure, you've seen data for both kinds of agents. For severe hospitalized UC, the only one that really has the most robust data would be infliximab, less so for adalimumab and the others. And for vedalizumab, we have no data yet. And then with safety, you have considerations with anti-TNFs of infections, which may be serious, rare lymphomas and immune phenomenon, and for veto, nasopharyngitis, and only a question of PML, which is theoretical at this point. So with that, I'll end, and thanks very much for your attention.